Thank you. Hey. Hi. Hey. <laughs> uh, could I see by a round of hands who's was this your first time watching the film? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, I would love to hear from one of you your first initial reaction. Maybe some of you are speechless, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but if you would like to share, I, I always love hearing first impressions. So, does anyone would like to go? I understand. I wouldn't want to stand up either after watching that film. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Um, I'd actually known a lot about you and this documentary before I even watched it. And I thought that you decided to stop calling yourself a feminist after you were done with it and after the backlash you received. But I didn't realize that that actually occurred beforehand. So um, it, uh, it, the situation is a lot worse than I thought it was. Um, I had seen parts of, of what you talked about and I knew about certain issues. But I was actually totally unaware of the whole Boko Haram thing. I just knew that, I, I knew, I suppose, my knowledge was concurrent with the optics that society provided, which was just numbers and bad in general. And then the girls that were kidnapped, and that was it. And I didn't realize um, everything that had occurred, the, the details of it. So thank you for providing that. Oh, thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, yeah, the I ended up dropping the label before I finished the film, and that was because I did a Kickstarter campaign to raise finishing funds for the film. So I, I self-financed the film for two and a half years of filming along with my now fiance and my mother. And uh, so we, the three of us self-financed the film and then we launched a Kickstarter campaign to raise finishing funds for post-production. And during that 30-day crowdfunder, I experienced a lot of backlash from my feminist friends and colleagues, uh, a lot of people that I, I knew through uh, roughly, I guess at that time, maybe eight years of filmmaking and making films about women's issues and people who really supported me for that work that refused to support this film. And so I found that really fascinating. And, and then there were a couple radical feminist bloggers that decided to wage a full-on smear campaign against my name and rewrite history and try to make me out into this demon online and uh, I just was shocked and I, I had to do a lot of soul searching and think about if I wanted to keep the label of feminist to try to work within the movement to be more inclusive of men's issues and I know that some other public figures have taken that route such as Christina Hoff Summers and Camille Paglia and I, I certainly admire the work that they're doing because I think that needs to be done and I'm glad they're working on that. Uh, but I just felt for myself personally that I, I really don't align with um, modern day feminist, feminism today and I didn't want to speak for feminism and I didn't want feminism or feminists to speak for me when, because it's really just my own thoughts and views and opinions now. And um, so that's why I dropped the label. Any uh, questions? I could also just ramble. <laughs> uh, honestly, in terms of first thoughts, as I watched the movie, I, I guess I was surrounded at the time when I was hearing about the movie. I was surrounded by people that were telling me who they hadn't watched the movie. They, they were telling me, "Oh, it's just a, it's just a, a person trying to come off as neutral, even though they're they're completely for men's rights and not for women's rights." And then I watched it and I realized that it was a very neutral movie. It was just showing that there are issues with men that aren't talked about as much as women. So I definitely think that a lot of people don't watch the movie and they just take that first impression that people tell them, even though those people haven't watched the movie themselves. So seeing it myself is was definitely eye-opening. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've tried so many times to uh, think of analogies to explain how difficult it is to talk about men's issues without coming across like you're putting down women or disregarding their issues. And I have joked with my family that I'm the best at bad analogies <laughs> uh, because I can never come up really with really good analogies. But one that, um, I mean, it's a bad one, but I'll <laughs> share it, is like uh, fighting for dolphins and whales issues. You know, like save the dolphins, save the whales. It's like, can we make a, a film about what dolphins are going through without people screaming, well, what about the whales? What about the whales? I mean, it all matters. 
but there is so much, there's so many platforms for people to talk about women's issues and they do get a lot of funding and social support and documentaries made about those issues and so I really wanted to give this two hour film a, at least an, a little bit of an adequate enough time to talk about men's issues although I still go into some women's issues just to help the feminists in the audience know I'm not trying to completely ignore their perspective um, so I mean it's just one of those things you have to like if you're debating with someone about these issues, you have to kind of bring it back down to we're not trying to disregard women's issues or support rape culture or victim blaming or anything. We're just, we want to talk about male victim domestic violence or uh, suicide rates and um, just to go on a little short tangent. The Oscars was last night and I'm always fascinated watching these uh, Hollywood award shows because they're really the past few years I and mean, they've just really been promoting feminism and uh, there's this Time's Up campaign and so I went to the Time's Up website today to see how, how the language is and it's all very uh, specific to we're, we're working on women's issues and women's equality in Hollywood and uh, female victims of sexual assault and harassment and for me personally, I, I absolutely believe that victims should be heard and there should be uh, you know, support and, and compassion towards true victims. I also believe in due process that people should be given uh, the opportunity to defend themselves and present ad evidence before you convict them of something. Uh, but I, I think of this Time's Up campaign and think, what if there was an Oscar movement for, uh, for talking about suicide rates. And they only said men. We need to talk about male victims of suicide. We need to talk about, because it is 75%, roughly 75% of all suicides are men, or no, actually, I'm sorry, 79 to 80% of all suicides in the world are men. Uh, but I don't think anyone would think we should only have a movement for male victims of suicide. There are still female victims that should be included in that discussion. And when we talk about uh, about veterans' rights, uh, I've been now very aware of everything I watch about gender issues, like how they word it, and I always hear politicians or whoever else saying, are men and women service members, or the men and women who uh, died in, in service or in combat. And they're always very conscious to include both. So I, I think that should be true for <coughs> victims of sexual assault as well, to include both genders in the discussion. Uh, still going on the topic of uh, first impressions, uh, I thought you did a really good job of presenting both sides of the argument, like, uh, like you said, uh, and both like the biases on both sides, even I saw that. Uh, I just agree with the, the overall uh, message, like this, the conversation just needs to happen that's the biggest thing and uh, uh, yeah just, uh, just interesting to see that it, it makes me want to go out and just do my own research you know, just just look at everybody's side yeah. just more than anything and get conversation started thank you thank you I really appreciate that oh, thank you um, when you do this sort of thing when you come do your Q&A's um, do you do you how often do you encounter like protesters or loud people when they come when you come to events like these? I know this one's pretty quiet, but I, but I imagine there are some at more politically active universities that are pretty loud. Yeah. You should have seen Australia. <laughs> Did you see Australia? <laughs> it's not off of this one, but I went I went to Cal State LA um, both during the Christian Hoff summers, which I went to, there was quite a lot of protests, and then I wasn't able to go to the Ben Shapiro one, but it was like a complete madness. So watching, just having this is just really relaxing. It kind of just puts, just you could just have talks and debates without yeah. having all that excess amount of, in my opinion, drama that shouldn't even be a thing. Definitely, this is my favorite screening size. <laughs> I love this, because uh, we can actually, you know, I can look in your eyes. And um, not be shouted over. And yeah, uh, we have definitely had protests, especially in Australia. I think that's where we've, where the film has made the biggest impact, for better or worse. Um, 
but it, it was, yeah, it definitely left a lot of ripples in that country, and then also in the UK and Canada. But the US has been really fascinating to me because I, I, I really do have a conspiracy that there's a gag order on this film in the US <laughs> where you just don't talk about it, don't make eye contact. And, and I think one of the ways um, the US media has tried to dismiss the film or, or get people to write it off, they will commonly talk about the red pill in articles in the past year since this film has been out. Uh, they'll talk about the red pill and associate it with either alt-right or racism or white supremacy or something like that. And they won't necessarily say the red pill documentary, but if you click on the hyperlink of the red pill, it'll lead to the documentary's webpage, uh, which you can tell a lot about um, journalists' motivation by the hyperlinks they include. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, the U.S., we haven't really made as big of a splash, but I, I think, I really do think that this film is going to be a slow boil to where people start to see it more and more as the years go on, and then maybe reflect back on the film and, and see that it was a little ahead of its time. Uh, and, gosh, this sounds so narcissistic. <laughs> this film is so ahead of its time. I'm on the front curve, yeah. Um, no, but I... I saw someone online on, on a Reddit, there was a Reddit page saying that someone wanted to come to the screening tonight, I don't know if you're here, but someone on Reddit said that they were gonna come to the screening and they listed out a bunch of questions they wanted to ask. He left. So, oh, did he leave? Yeah, I guess he had a paper later. Yeah, and one of them was, um, the questions that he put on his post said, do you think it's getting better for men's rights now after this film? Is that you? That was your, oh, thank you for posting on there. I really appreciate that. Well, can I answer your question? Uh, sure. First of all, what will your next project uh, project be? Okay, we'll go in the order. So, my next project, I'm going to leave you all in suspense. I don't know yet. Ah. <laughs> well, I haven't committed to one yet. I've tossed over so many different ideas, and I mean, it really just runs the gamut, but I'm kind of one of those filmmakers where I don't want to say it publicly mm. until I'm, I'm really certain this is the one. So, hopefully soon they'll all announce it. I just thought of this one just now, but are you gonna put that video on YouTube, please? If you ask, yes, I, I will. No, I, I was always planning on putting this on YouTube. Yeah, I've started filming them because you never know what's gonna happen, and sometimes it's just safer <laughs> to have a camera rolling because I do feel like it's a protector at times. Uh, yeah. Uh, did you wanna go through all, your, or you could bounce around? Mm, bounce around a bit. Okay, right there. You... Yeah. Um, I know that the movie is uh, about the 70s mm -hmm. and the mid-70s. Uh, my friend here told me that this movie was made in 2015, but a lot of the scripts in it are from the 70s, am I correct? Uh, well, some of the figures, like Warren Farrell, he was really big in the yeah. 70s, yeah. Okay, now, you think that women's rights have improved since the 70s? Is that it? Oh. Yeah. Uh, I do, actually. Um, I personally, I'm kind of an enigma on my political spectrum because I you can't really place me anywhere. I consider myself liberal and in that way there are a lot of women's issues that I align with on the left um, but yes I am grateful for a lot of the uh, some of the different policies that feminism has uh, brought about and achieved although now after making this film I realize that it's also harmed men especially fathers in a lot of ways um, so I can't say that I fully support all that feminism has done, but elements of it I'm grateful for. If that makes sense. Did you have another question? No. Uh, Patrick? Um, you said that uh, you hope this video will be seen as this time. I think it will. Be. I'll just back it up. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's my source. Yeah, right. Um, you know, as, as someone who's been studying this whole scene 
and intersectional social justice for a while. I'd say it's about time something got made, and I'm very grateful that you made it, so thank you. Um, and I remember watching an interview with you on, I think, Honey Badger Radio, and you said that you were afraid this whole chain of events and what happened around this killed your career ahead of time. Do you still feel that way? Uh, yes, in a way it has, um, as far as many doors closing from making this film and being affiliated with this. Um, certainly my reputation has been you know, smeared in a lot of different ways that's hard to bounce back from. Uh, I do hope that in the future, when they look back, they can see through the misinformation and connect the dots. But right now, there's a lot of misinformation floating around about me in the film. Uh, so yeah, I do think I, I, I've definitely had some um, big, uh, high-profile doors closed in Hollywood for having made this. Uh, with that said, I, I do think I have now other opportunities with, with people who do really support my work. and understand what I, I tried to do with this film and that I'm really just seeking the truth and trying to understand everything and, and um, you know I'm st I still consider myself a student I am still wanting to learn about all the different facets of this and that and in that way I don't consider myself preaching any kind of agenda or ideology or like this is the answer or this is the direction we need to go in I am still learning and, and this film is really just meant to be a conversation starter it was pretty amazing how, how you were received in Australia. I watched a lot of different coverage on that from different YouTubers, and I was kind of baffled by it. Um, I knew that Australia was pretty left in some regards, but I didn't realize that they would go so out of their way to just absolutely drag you through the dirt. And, and I, yeah, so I was sorry to see that. But, and as you said, for the US, I'm a bit kind of surprised at the lack of exposure in this country as well. And you, know, you talked about the conspiracy theory might not be far off. The media is overall owned by, I think, six people. So, yeah. you know, if someone somewhere decided to blacklist it, then it had to trickle down the tree. So, yeah. but I am beginning to notice myself through different social media forums that a lot more people are noticing, and a lot more people are, are gaining attention. And if anything, but all the anger and the loud noise and the screaming that's been generated by your opposition has actually probably made you more, has probably given this film more exposure, so. Yeah. Well, that's what I do love about uh, this film's fan base is that it's really intellectual people and curious people online trying to find the truth for themselves, and I love that about this film's fan base. And uh, I'm always surprised to hear who's heard about the film. And like, I was even sitting in my dentist chair one time, and he's like, "So I heard you're a filmmaker." And I was like, "Yeah." And he said, "What's your film?" And I, said I, I just released the film called Red Pill and he, his jaw dropped he's like oh, the Red Pill everyone's talking about that and he, he's a dentist in the Bay Area in San Francisco and I I really haven't seen people publicly pronounce that they you know love the film and support but it's really like under the radar they're kind of whisper, whispering to their friends or family like hey you should check this out and we can talk about it but I think it speaks volumes that people are too afraid to be open about wanting to share the film and that, or that they like the film. Uh, it just really sp speaks volumes. Right here. Uh, I just want, well, I've supported your Patreon, so it's like this is my second time seeing it. And um, just as a reflection, the Boko Haram part was really hard for me, so I've been trying to figure that out since. So I'm still working on it. Um, yeah, I'm still not sure what to make of it, but also when I try and like mention this film, I try and say, this is a counterpoint to the mask you live in. It shows something that, that you don't see. It, it, I, I don't think it shows up on anyone who needs to hear it, you know, on my uh, stream. So, and uh, also to point out some updates from, from it, Fred uh, Hayward, I think, uh, the guy who's had a, who lost custody of his son, he actually was reunited with his son. And then there are a total, I, at least as I know of, three men's shelters across Canada and uh, the United States. The Arkansas one, the one in Houston, and then Cafe, I think, in Ottawa, just got funded. Um, there was one in Arizona, but they were uh, religious-based, and I think they were another funded. Three! Thank you Progress. for remembering all of it. Yeah, <laughs> you always forget to share the, the good success stories. Uh, yeah, so Fred Hayward, who was the, the father who 
uh, had to give up custody of his son uh, because of what he went through in the court system. And he was reunited with his son, and they went to the LA premiere of this film and had a red carpet photo, and it's a really great success story. They're very close now, and um, his son really supports the film, and I see him plugging it online. It's really cool. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, there's a lot of success stories that I think have come from this film. You also kind of have to take it with a little solemn feeling, but uh, I've gotten so many, like a shocking number of emails of people saying that they were contemplating suicide and this film gave them hope. And um, yeah, it's, it's really shocking. I mean, it's been overwhelming all the emails I've gotten of people's personal stories of what they've been through and, and what they're going through, men and women, all ages. Uh, yeah, and, and it, it really is like this silent epidemic. I mean, it's, it's a, a silent group of people who have so much going on, but they can't talk about it publicly without being shamed. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Have you been approached uh, for a book deal? or something like that? Um, I have, but I don't think it was, <laughs> I, I don't think it was a real deal. They were just like, hey, I'm a publisher, you should write a book for us. And I, I've seen yeah. it several times, and uh, I'm still adjusting, I'm still uh, digesting and, you know, all the information there. I did my own research too, I've been going through this for a decade, mm -hmm. and uh, I sort of gave up on the research and, uh, uh, as I see in the movie, it's very balanced, and it's very, you know, like unapproachable the way everything is presented. Not in a bad way, but in a good way, because it's not like. Um, and what would I would like, I would like to be able to, is to, you know, have it on hard copy somehow, and it's almost like a text. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a, to me. Like the transcript of the film. Yeah. Well, yeah. transcript via. You know, you can always expound yourself on in words. Right. You know? yeah. And uh, act like you said that uh, you did this for a year, right? Well, it took three and a half years to make. Three and a half. But years. yeah, I filmed for a year. You're right. I'm about sure that. Yeah. you could probably add a lot of information and detail and like bring things up to speed. I don't want you to be a you know professor, <laughs> you know, because I know uh, just being a filmmaker is very difficult and being know, actress and then a filmmaker and a documentary filmmaker, it's even worse because you're restricted to a certain degree, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely wouldn't put myself in the same category as like a Jordan Peterson a academic who's, you know, <laughs> talking about Why his not? philosophies. <laughs> well, I'm 31 and I didn't go to college. Um, <laughs> I know, so? the horror. Uh, Dean Martin didn't. You know. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people that have self-educated themselves to the point where they're like Carol Strong. Mm -hmm. She's not. She's the same way. This is a very, uh, you know, and I don't mean to monitor, monopolize the conversation, but I mean, uh, there's a lot of people who have opened up venues in colleges, like the Gender Studies program. Mm -hmm. They don't have professors in there. I mean, <laughs> they've never went to any four-year university and got a four-year university degree in Gender Studies. They just pulled it out of the hat, you know, mm -hmm. basically, and. Uh, but, um, and the reason I bring this up is because I was uh, in the military for, for many, many years. And uh, a lot of times a, a course was generated after someone said it needed to be there. Now go do it. And uh, so that's kind of like how I did it. And, and I became an expert in, in a few things, not to kill people. It was more like in physical fitness things and things like that. But uh, there was no starting point. It was just like there was a void, mm -hmm. and it was filled. And this, it, obviously, there's a void here, you know, yeah. with men's rights. It's a complete void. Nobody, nobody even thinks about it, let alone acts on it. So yeah. anyway, that's my little. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I would like to see it in a book deal. I mean, you know, yeah. maybe Milo, he's got a publishing house. Oh, right. He's <laughs> own publishing house. Now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Well, what you were saying about uh, the research done and, and that you found it very balanced and, you know, all the research lines Extremely. up. Yeah, I, 
That's something that I'm very proud of about this film is it was really combed through with our producers and lawyers and legal team and everyone to make sure everything could be backed and you, you can't uh, refute what is said in here because of how it's the context of it being brought up and, and citing the source and I, I've seen people uh, on Twitter, there, there's a ton of Twitter accounts that I swear were just created to like stir up stuff <laughs> and, and put out lies and see how often it could get retweeted and so one of the tweets that's about this film out there oh that film was debunked a long time ago oh yeah that film's been debunked it's never been debunked they will say it's been debunked there's no proof <laughs> there's nothing about this film that has that's in the film that has been successfully refuted uh, so I mean the, the biggest lie that's spread about the film to try to discredit me in the film is is doing this Kickstarter campaign and you know the best answer I have to that is we also had feminists fund a Kickstarter, but the bottom line with the Kickstarter is that none of the Kickstarter backers, as you know, as a backer, had any influence over how the film was created or or had like a final cut say or anything like that. So, so it really is, you know, this is my uh, a product of my inner workings and um, and you know back to the the Oscar thing. I mean the. The big thing is support female directors, but you have to stay on script. Right. Uh, if you're if you're not on on that kind of narrative side, they do not want to make eye contact with you or support you or let you on their shows to do an interview or anything like that. So, um, you, you speaking know. from personal experience? Yes, I am. <laughs> A lot of personal experience, uh, and and I think that is what um, you know. And I say this as a liberal, so, but I think that is what is may happen to the left is it's going to eat itself with the hypocrisy and that's what I think we need to become aware of because it's rampant and um, and you know if you really want to talk about gender equality then you need to talk about all genders and and not demonize one group of people and only support and lift up the other Okay. <laughs> Another one from the list. Do you think uh, Paula Long's approach of provocation is a good way to get people to start listening to men's rights issues? Okay, Paul Elon. Elon, no, you're right, Elon. I, for all the time I was filming, I always said Elon. Uh, so, Paul Elon, uh, I absolutely see the value in what he's doing and what he's done because people weren't talking about the men's rights movement on this level at, at that scale before A Voice for Men came around. And it was his poking the beehive that finally got attention. I know that Warren Farrell did a lot of work in, in late 60s, early 70s, and he did have some great success being on the Donahue show and all these other shows. Um, but he was still, I think he, he definitely got overshadowed by a lot of the, the feminists in the media talking. and. And the people who gravitated to Warren Farrell's books, you know, I mean, it's a very small percentage of the population that even read books. And then you have to find the people who read books that I want to talk or read about men's issues. It's a very small slice. So, you know, Warren Farrell had great success with The Myth of Male Power and his other books. Uh, but Paul Elam, uh, he started provoking and it, it got people to perk up their ears and wonder, well, what's that about? men's rights movement, never heard of that before. Um, granted, I think a lot of damage control has had to be <laughs> been done by the men's rights movement because of Paul's writings. Um, but, you know, I, I, my thought on Paul is that he's more of a, uh, what's the word? I mean, he's, he's a provocateur, but, but it, it's the, the Paul that I know and that I've seen with his female partner of over a decade and uh, his friendships and, and what he thinks about women's issues and what he cares about, it's not the same person writing for a voice for men. Um, I think he does have, he's gonna hate me saying this, but I think he does have a soft spot <laughs> and, um, and, and he knew that, you know, if you wanna get attention, you kinda have to play this game online that's happening right now, which is offend, provoke, and that's how you get written about. And that really is, what happens. I mean, e even look at the Red Pill movie, I don't think the film would have been um, as talked about or looked into without what happened in Australia last June. 
the, the protests and the interviews that I did and, and all this, I mean, it got people riled up because either they were offended or there were people who didn't agree with people being offended so they, they became a supporter. Uh, that that polarization is what trickles up to the, the top of the newsfeed. And yeah, so I think Paul's, you know, it's a tactic, what he does. Um, sorry to interrupt. It's 6.07, so if you oh, wanted thank you. a couple minutes to walk around. Thank you. So we actually have to head out to a film festival. Oh. Uh, so should we just do one last question, and then sure. anyone who wants to say hi afterwards, you can do that. So one last question. Look right here. Um, you mentioned about <coughs> running a follow uh, feminist orthodoxy and having more people there. Right here. Yeah. Um, about a year ago, uh, this time, Harvey Weinstein is, uh, announced that he was going to establish a foundation that, amongst other things, he's going to promote more women directors. Now, this was before <laughs> the whole Me Too thing, of course. Yeah. And we you know what happened six months after that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, now your movie was made before this whole Me Too mm -hmm. movement uh, started. Uh, what is your opinion of? of me too. You mentioned some, you know, you mentioned Time's Up and Me Too. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's sort of time? Do you think it's gone overboard? Thank you uh, for that question. Thank you so much. I have a lot of thoughts, so yeah. I'll try to <laughs> condense it. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know if anyone's seen this before. I haven't seen it mentioned online, but in the Red Pill movie, this was made long before the Me Too campaign became, you know, something. Uh, so in the Red Pill movie, I say I lived in Hollywood where I was uh, being sexually object objectified and I was only getting roles where I'd die in the first 10 minutes of a horror film and, and I was being hit on by producers and, and other authority figures that I, I did not want that type of sexual attention from. And so I, I briefly mentioned that in the beginning of the film. And that is absolutely true that when I was acting in LA from 18 years old to I think I was 24, 23, 24. Uh, it, it was a very uncomfortable experience, and that's what I think largely led to me becoming a feminist. Um, so, you know, it also makes me wonder because Hollywood does have the loudest microphone as far as, you know, talking about a lot of these uh, cultural phenomenons, um, you know, maybe there are a lot more feminists in Hollywood than the rest of the country because they're experiencing. Mm -hmm experiencing this type of sexism. And um, so, yes, I do absolutely think and know that that happens to a lot of women in Hollywood as well as men, and that's a portion that gets left out often. And I, I do think it's really sad that a lot of male victims who have come out with the Me Too campaign just completely get brushed over. And, um, you know, the, the male perpetrator is remembered, like Kevin Spacey, but you want to include the, the male victim uh, in the, you know, let's all wear black to the Golden Globes type of thing. So, uh, as far as my thoughts on the campaign, you know, my, my biggest criticism is that it's so uh, one-sided as far as only acknowledging victims that are female. And if of all the gender issues, I wouldn't see that being appropriate for any gender issue, like, like only acknowledging male victims of suicide. Um, and what else? I, you know, I, I hope that it does help give people courage to come out with their own story. But I do think there is, there has been a, a witch hunt in uh, pointing fingers and taking down people's reputations without due process. And I find that really sad. And, and the, again, the hypocrisy is rampant. And a good example of this is Scarlett Johansson was. Uh, calling out James Franco for wearing a Time's Up pin. And apparently James Franco was accused of uh, eliciting a, a relationship with an underage girl, but he actually ended it right when he found out she was underage. And uh, So Scarlett Johansson was saying, I want my pin back. And yet the, hypocr the hypocrisy of this is that she was in three Woody Allen films. And for decades, <laughs> Woody Allen has you know, had accusations against him, and she supported him through all that. Uh, so, you know, I think <laughs> it's, it's just really interesting to see how, how many layers there is to this campaign. And, um, and I, I think the worst part about the campaign is the demonization 
of men. Uh, and I don't think it's going to help women either because I think men are going to be afraid to hire women being afraid of being accused. And I've heard that men won't even have a meeting with the door closed, one-on-one -on -one meeting with a woman now because they're afraid of being accused or they'll ask for a third person as a witness in you know, what should be just a business meeting. So uh, yeah, I, I just think uh, the gender war has gotten far worse than uh, you know, even Warren Farrell or Aaron Pizzi uh, saw back in the, the 70s. I, I do think it's gotten worse and, and that's not going to be good for relationships or families. Um, and I, I do, I mean, this is another road to go down, but I, I think kids are really going to be the ones losing out on a lot. Um, so on that cheery note, <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you so much for coming and thank you Men Against Violence for inviting me. Oh, I love that. Yeah, what is it? it's our shirt oh. or the tank top. What's on the back? A heart. Oh, nice. And then this one's for Evan, too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And then we also have a bunch of these in the back. If you like, I can sign one. <laughs> if you like, please. <laughs> so, and yeah. Yeah, if you want a photo or anything, but we, we do have to head out mm -hmm. soon, so we'll, we'll make it all quick. But mm -hmm. thank you so much. You're welcome. Really cool. <laughs> all right, thank you. Yeah, if someone's big hires for the guys, it's like, oh, 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 it's like, oh